Zimbabwe, and it's the largest public sector trade union, agrees to a significantly lower pay hike than what it demanded under the previous government. That's our top story in Caribbean Newsline for Thursday, June 7. From the CMC News Center in Bridgetown, I'm Nicole Best. Good evening. The National Union of Public Workers is on the verge of accepting a 4.5% pay hike for government workers, a mere fraction of the 23% increase it had insisted it expected from the previous Frundell Stewart-led administration. The NUPW had been at loggerheads with the previous government for more than a year, demanding the double-digit pay hike. But two weeks after the mere motley-led Barbados Labour Party won elections, it has made an about turn. After a meeting with the government on Wednesday, the union approved the single-digit salary offer with only one council member abstaining and all others voting in favor of the proposed hike for the 2016 to 2019 negotiating period of 2% in the first year, 1.5% in the second, and 1% in the third year. But the NUPW has no intention of relinquishing outstanding back pay covering the period 2011 to 2016. Union President Akani McDowell says there will be certain conditionalities attached to the wage increase, but he says he won't disclose any more information until both parties make a final decision. The councillors agreed with what the Ministry of Civil Service was um, proposing, but we decided to um, submit an, um, our proposal to the Ministry of Civil Service, which is in line with what they are suggesting. So once the Ministry of Civil Service approves the proposal that we submitted, it would mean that public servants should be a little happier about that. And you're saying that you're, you're comfortable that everything would work out the Yes, I am. I am. I mean, we, there, there's not much difference between what the Ministry of Civil Service has presented to us and what the NUPW has suggested. So um, it's very unlikely that they would not accept what we, we are suggesting, that the Prime Minister has dedicated um, to having constant consultations and, and it is, a, is a, as I said to you, is a, a a good sign and it augurs well for our relationship going forward. Um, what is even more impressive about the tone of the meeting is that she's willing to listen. Before, you had a situation where ideas would have been put forward, but you, you weren't necessarily sure whether or not people were, the, the administration was willing to accept those ideas. It was last December that the then Stuart led government had offered the union a $49 million lump sum payment that would have seen civil servants at the higher end of the salary scale receiving a 2% payment for one year and those at the lower end a 5% hike based on a sliding scale. But the proposal did not sit well with the NUPW's executive, which said the payments would have amounted to less than $2,500 per worker. Meanwhile, opposition senator and trade unionist Caswell Franklin has described the NUPW leadership as political prostitutes for accepting the paltry pay increase. He accused the union of using the workers' plight to accomplish political ends. And Franklin says the membership of the NUPW must make their leadership give account. He went further to accuse the NUPW leadership of using its influence to attempt to bring down the former administration. The opposition senator also argued that had the NUPW's offer been reasonable in the first place, workers would have received a pay hike a long time ago. Staying in Barbados, a priest has come out in support of the move by members of the LGBT community to get the same rights as heterosexual couples. Anglican priest Noel Burke's public support comes on the heels of three LGBT uh, activists going to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the I. ACHR to challenge the country's buggery laws. Burke says he believes LGBT people have every right to go to the IACHR to put their case and be heard. The Barbadians are challenging sections 9 and 12 of the island's constitution which criminalize buggery and serious indecency. And over in Guyana, there are calls for dialogue between the Christian community and the LGBT community. This follows what the community describes as a successful parade last weekend. Christians had expressed outrage over the planned event and had called on authorities to prevent it from happening. The weekend parade was organized by the Society Against Sexual Orientation Discrimination, SASSOD, and its founder says they have no intentions to fight with the Christian community. We get more in this report from Javon Vickery of HGP-TV.
Despite the concern raised by the Christian community about a parade at the weekend organized by the LGBT community, organizers of that event are calling it a success. Founder of Sassad, Joel Simpson, made it clear that there is no intention by the LGBT community to wage a war with the Christian faith over the human rights of the LGBT. PPP Member of Parliament Priya Manikchan, who attended the parade at the weekend, shared the view that instead of continuous disagreements, dialogue between the two groups is needed. You can't have um, one side issuing a press conference and another side issuing a press conference, and then there's no meeting of the minds. And in many of these issues, um, perception is what leads the day. So you see someone dressed in heels who should look like person wearing running shoes and you assume that everyone who is in the LGBT community is like that person and that is not necessarily so um, and so in every community it uh, in um, and, and the LGBT community is no exception you will have persons who may offend individual persons who may offend various sections of society. Manik Chan further stated that no religious or secular group should condemn the way another group operates. She called for respect. Meanwhile, Simpson stated that as it pertains to the human rights of the LGBT in Guyana, the government should start acting on their promise made three years ago. We are a secular democracy. We're not a theocracy. Our laws and our public policy are not based on any religion. None at all. Not one or a combination thereof. We have to have objective standards for making policies and laws in the country, and that objective standard is human rights. Not a Bible, not a Quran, not a Bagua Gita, nothing of this sort. Police opposition politician Juan Brasino is calling for residents to lend a helping hand to the Guatemalan neighbors affected by the recent eruption of the Fuego volcano. The eruption occurred on Sunday and reports so far are that approximately 99 people are confirmed dead and 200 still missing. Brasenio, who leads the People's United Party, is calling on government to assist the needy and he says the opposition will support any such efforts. We call on the government and all Belizeans to offer whatever humanitarian assistance we can to our neighbor Guatemala and will support efforts by the government to provide assistance through regional organizations. On Monday, in the wake of the eruption, Israel delivered food, blankets, and medicine through its embassy in Guatemala. Several humanitarian organizations are also responding. Human resources, personnel, and other forms of assistance are expected to help families in Chimaltenango, Zacatecpeques, Esquintla, Mixco, and other areas of Guatemala City that are affected. The Guatemalan Red Cross is, of course, out there responding and several hundreds of their volunteers are on standby to be called upon. Um, they have been working their ambulances, they have been, people have been reporting in great numbers into their hospital, the Red Cross Hospital. Um, and of course, the, the Red Cross is also assisting with the tracing of missing people okay. through our Restoring Family Links um, program. So there's a great deal of work to be done. And um, while we are not there seeing the impact, we can see the pictures on the news, and that alone can tell you what the people are suffering. Belize Red Cross has since launched a monetary appeal to help survivors of the volcano eruption as wounded and traumatized survivors continue to be rushed to hospitals by the sister Red Cross organization in Guatemala. It's a dire time for the Red Cross family, says Executive Director Lily Bowman. That's a sister national society, and they are in trouble. They need our help. So we do cross borders, as our seven fundamentals, uh, fundamental principles would say. Um, we cross borders to, to help. Although we, we, um, we may, in this case, be crossing borders with, our, with financial assistance. So we have launched, launched an appeal today to support the efforts of the um, Red Cross um, in the response to this terrible, terrible volcano eruption that has so far um, that caused the death of at least 62 people and so many, I mean a number of undetermined, uh, an undetermined number of people ha have been missing. Bowman says that they are responding to the call of many businesses and persons who have been asking of how they can help.
Unfortunately, the Belize Red Cross cannot accept in-kind donations. That's clothing, food items. We don't have storage capacity for this. Also, it's very expensive to move from our offices to the Guatemalan Red Cross office. However, we believe that launching our appeal for monetary assistance is going to help a great deal because, for instance, they can put that money directly into the most needed areas mm -hmm. for, for people who have been affected. And that report was from Dwayne Moody of Channel 5 News in Belize. Well, Caribbean heads are among world leaders expressing condolences to the government and people of Guatemala as they attempt to pick up the pieces following the devastating eruption. Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis, Timothy Harris, in a letter to Guatemalan President Jimmy Morales, said his country is saddened by the destruction. And he added that the people of the Twin Island Federation are praying that the affected families will be able to overcome the catastrophe and return to a peaceful life and that the nation of Guatemala is restored to stability and a promising future as soon as possible. Cuban President Miguel Diaz-Canel has also expressed his condolences to President Morales and the people of Guatemala in a letter to the country's president. And still to come in Caribbean Newsline, Antigua and Barbuda's opposition leader and anti-government march will be right back. Stay with us. Okay, we apologize for that. We do have some technical difficulties at this point in time, so we will continue with that story that I promised you. It is that we continue in Antigua and Barbuda where dozens of people turn out in response to an opposition party march against government on Thursday afternoon. Leader of the United Progressive Party, Harold Lavelle, had told citizens to wear white to the march to express dissatisfaction with the government's handling of several controversial issues. He said the Gaston Brown-led administration is failing to adequately address issues such as the recent passport scandal in which Assistant Superintendent of Police Ray Anthony John and his mother Yvonne Nicky were charged with five counts of conspiracy to forge Antigua and Barbuda's passports. Lovell says other issues of concern include police incompetence and the government's relationship with PV Energy, a company owned by British billionaire Peter Verdi and his associate, both of whom had allegedly discussed bribing Caribbean politicians. Verdi is wanted in Germany for alleged tax evasion. Lovell said that his party will seek to get these issues addressed through every legal means available to it, including making inquiries through the Integrity Commission, marches, and the court system. The issue of taxation is one of the key areas that need to be addressed in any move towards developing a cannabis industry in the Caribbean. That's according to cannabis operations expert and chief strategist in the BSC group, Brian Staffer, who was speaking at the Caribbean Marketing Confederation on the way in New York. He says while taxation may be necessary, governments must strike the right balance. assumes that taxation is the cash cow. And I just want to be, uh, give a, a cautionary tale. While taxation can be one way, taxation directly on the product, directly on the operators that are creating it, and then at some sort of the end of the sale, perhaps with a sales tax, that's only one portion. And I caution to not create too high of a tax burden because you will have the black market continue to prol proliferate and it will be harder and harder to regulate that program if it's too burdensome. I'll give you a tangible example in the next slide, uh, but it's also key to not have too low of a tax structure because then you won't be able to fund the program effectively. And there are other ways that you could fund the program by different patient fees that if you keep them low, uh, but the big thing is be very cognizant of what the market will bear in your region uh, and perhaps take note of what black market pricing is because your ultimate goal is to stamp out that black market, get everybody onto the regulated side because it is much safer. Several Caribbean countries are exploring the option of decriminalizing marijuana. 
Earlier this year, the Antigua and Barbuda government passed legislation permitting the possession of 15 grams of ganja and the growing of four cannabis plants per household. And the government's chief of staff, Lionel Max Hurst, says that the laws dealing with medical marijuana would likely make provisions for a board to issue license. Dominica's Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt this week says he is in support of the use of the herb for medical and religious purposes. Jamaica was the first Caribbean country to pass a law decriminalizing small amounts of marijuana for recreational use. The Jamaica government says it will soon unveil a comprehensive anti-crime plan. National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang said the plan will be unveiled during his presentation in the sectoral debate in Parliament earlier next week. The country has recorded approximately 200 murders so far this year, despite the continuation of the zones of special operations in known crime hotspots across the country. In in March, Prime Minister Andrew Holness told Parliament that the government would soon disclose its crime plan, but there needs to be bipartisan support, adding that the opposition spokesman on national security, Fitz Jackson, had already attended a National Security Council meeting. And ahead in Newsline Sport, West Indies take control of the first test against Sri Lanka. Stay with us. Sport is next. Kids Music Festival from June 27 to July 1st, 2018, featuring Kesty Band, Simba Lodgy, Small Act Band, Nyla Blackman, and Betty Wack. Also, Patti LaBelle, Dijon, New Vibes International, Rhythm of the Beat, and Wayne Wonder. Five, August Alpina, Aishana, Byron Messiah, Dasha. Do you wish to combine a vacation with your laughter? Then St. Martin is the place to be on June 22nd and 23rd for the 14th annual edition of its comedy festival, Laugh Till Belly Burst, with comedians from all over the world. Book hotel and show tickets until June 20th now at www.ltbbsxm.com. Lanka lost their openers and one other wicket early in their innings after West Indies declared on 414 for 8 on day 2 of the first test on Thursday. After rain delays, West Indies resumed on 246 for 6 at Queen's Park Oval in Trinidad. And they took control of the match thanks to wicketkeeper batsman Shane Dowlich who struck his second test 100 en route to a 125 not out at the end of the West Indies innings. He turned the last ball before the interval from left arm spinner Ranganga through square for a single to reach three figures, becoming the first Windies keeper to score a century against the Asian side. Here's a look at play leading up to that moment. was on exactly 100 and accompanied by tail ender Kimar Roach on four as West Indies climbed to 
350 for seven. Devan Jobishu was the only wicket to fall in the extended post lunch session for 40 after adding 102 for the seventh wicket. The left hand uh, faced 160 balls and counted five fours before slashing at a wide from one speedster and falling to a catch at the wicket 45 minutes before tea. Kimar Roach was the eighth wicket to fall for 39. And after West Indies declared Sri Lanka faltered almost immediately, the visitors ended on 31 for 3, trailing by 383 runs at the end of the day's play. They lost the wickets of Kusal Mendes, Kusal Pereira, and Angelo Matthews. Good batting, but then the declaration came the Sri Lankan openers. Look what happened on the very first ball Kusal Pereira faced. Very simple catch to cover. In his comeback game after 15 test matches, going for that drive square of the wicket. That's the way he plays, but unfortunately, played to the man. Then it was uh, the Gabriel show, all with sustained hostility. That's the wicket of uh, Kusal Mendes. Then Angelo Matthews. This is another look of that uh, catch. It was referred, it was sent upstairs, confirmed. As soon as he came in, was given a life. Fairly straightforward, simple chance for the captain. Sri Lanka were already fighting somewhat with their backs to the wall. West Indies didn't have to wait for too long. There were a few deliveries that bounced. And the new ball proved extremely effective. This was a one delivery that hit the uh, elbow of Dinesh Chandimal and the other one from uh, Gabriel really hit the helmet of Matthews. It was never a comfortable stay for the Sri Lankan batsman. Against some hostile bowling. Matthews bounced on the first delivery, hold the ball. And then the perfect outswinger. Good catch at third slip. That was a big blow. Sri Lanka's most experienced test batsman Angelo Matthews like slightly away from his body good catch in the slips so that's done 631 for three that's the story well day two turned out much better than day one for the Windies but after Wednesday's play batsman she hope who scored 44 before being run out said the Queen's Park Oval pitch did not allow batsmen the luxury of ever feeling quite settled. And he said the pitch had been a bit too paced. Uh, it was a bit up and down. Some of the balls were kicking, some were staying down. So as a batsman, you need to apply yourself and protect the wicket. Sometimes you, know, you don't feel you're ever quite in, but application is the key. You we now go back to the highlights we promised you earlier from the Wendy's. Were some shots that traveled to the boundary, some not off the middle of the bat, and there were moments of anguish as well as Sri Lanka's bowlers probed and couldn't get the close calls to go their way against Shane Dorridge. Alim Dab was outstanding with his umpiring. Devendra Pishu did have a few close calls, but by and large, it was a very restrained innings. Not afraid to play a few shots when the opportunity permitted. A few off the top edge, and some fine deflections. They all counted. Dowrich was uh, simply magnificent at the partnership, a record seventh wicket stand. Was finally broken when Roshan Silva held on to a good catch in the gully. But uh, the West Indies have definitely battered Sri Lanka. I wouldn't say out of the game, but into a very difficult position. Yes, and we see the ball even today from Lakmal continue to nip away, nip back. So even though it's a slow pace to the game, I think it's partly because there's still something in it for the bowlers. Again, the clo close call going in the Windy's favor. This time to Roach. Another one. 
and good umpiring from Aline Dahl. So I think we'll find out more about this pitch when we see the West Indies or the Windies bowl. But the umpiring, very good there. Alim Da had a wonderful day today. Let's not forget, day one wasn't great for the umpires, and this was the moment. The last ball before T. And Shane Dowrich achieved, reached a magnificent 100. Thoroughly satisfying. 100 not out. West Indies go to T on 350 for 7. All right, we move over now to football, where Jamaica has been named as host for the final round of the 2018 CONCACAF Caribbean Women's Qualifier, which gets underway in August. The first round group winners, Antigua and Barbuda, Bermuda, Cuba and Trinidad and Tobago, will join the hosts in the round-robin tournament from August 25th to September 2nd, as they bid for one of the three places available in the CONCACAF Women's Championship. Jamaica won Group B of the first round stage. Uh, last month in Haiti when they played unbeaten to top the group ahead of the hosts. Similarly, Antigua played unbeaten en route to winning all three games to capture Group D at home in St. John's, while Bermuda topped Group E in Guyana. Cuba, meanwhile, won Group A staged in the Dominican Republic, while Trinidad and Tobago edged St. Kitts and Nevis in Port of Spain to win Group C. Eight teams will compete in the CONCACAF Women's Championship set to be played in the United States. A series of accidents over the Sol Rally Barbados weekend has prompted the Barbados Rally Club, the BRC, to look at its approach to dealing with such incidents. The most serious accident was last Saturday involving Russell Branker and co-driver Darrell Clark. Clark sustained internal injuries and was flown out for medical attention the next day while Branker suffered spinal injuries and efforts uh, were being made to get him to Miami. And that's the sport. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Follow your heart to the 22nd annual St. Kitts Music Festival from June 27 to July 1st, 2018. Featuring Kesty Banjo, Simba Trilogy, Small X Band, Nyla Blackman, and Betty Wack. Also, Patty LaBelle, Dijon, New Vibes International, Rhythm of the Beat, and Wayne Wonder. Shaka Dimas and Bias and Miss Lauren Hill. Save the date and book now for the 22nd annual St. Kitts Music Festival and experience like no other. Again, the major developments of this day, the National Union of Public Workers on the verge of accepting a 4.5% pay hike for government workers in Barbados, a far cry from the 23% increase it had demanded from the previous administration. And in sport, Sri Lanka lose three wickets early in their innings after West Indies declared on 414 for eight on day two of the first test. That's Caribbean Newsline. For news and sport around the clock, log on to carnanews.com. We'll be back here again tomorrow. But from all of us at CMC News, thank you for watching and do have yourselves a good night.